Hey, thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. We have prayed that you'd be blessed by it. Uh, we want you to know, too, we believe that this is really supplemental uh, to your, your experience in the life of a local church. But if you're here in the Dallas area, we hope you'll come and join us and be with us for worship. We pray this blesses your life and you're drawn closer to Christ as a result of this message. Friends, we are a family on a journey. And we're called to love and forgive and serve one another. And as we love each other, as the watching world sees how we grace one another, they're going to want to get in on it. And they're going to wonder, what is it that drives us? destination is Christ. He's our focus and He's where we're heading. Every one of us. He is the one we exalt. He's the one we worship. It's His mission that we join. All right, we celebrate uh, last Sunday, Vision Sunday, nearly 50 or so folks who were baptized out uh, front. Some of you were able to come and be a part of that great celebration. You know, there's nothing more important in the life of a church than baptism. It's that commitment that we've made to the Lord seen publicly, really what he's done for us. If you've not been baptized, I want to challenge you if you've received Christ. We've had some folks who've already joined our church this morning. And uh, one little gal came with parents uh, saying that she had come to her mom and wanted her mom and dad to know that she'd asked Christ to come into her heart. She'll be baptized soon. And if you've not had the opportunity to do so, we want to encourage you. Hey, I want to offer a big welcome again to all of our guests. We're glad that you're here. We'll catch you up with what's happening here in the life of our church. We've been walking through this series called Courageous, how to live with faith in fearful times. We're walking through fearful times. You know this, right? We're, in the next couple of weeks, we're going to start um, a, a new series that we're entitling after uh, Homecoming Sunday, which is October the 2nd. It'd be the night then. Starting a new series um, entitled uh, Decision 2016. Uh, we're going to look at the politics of Jesus. People are saying in our election season that it really seems like the lesser of two evils is what some have said. Let me just say this, that um, until Jesus runs for president, it's going to be the lesser of two options that are not perfect. And so we're going to talk about uh, really Jesus how he would speak of how we live together. We're going to look at some of the key issues. It's not going to be all about the election. I think you'll have had enough of it by then. But we're going to lead us biblically. How and what is our place? That's coming in a few weeks. Right now, though, we're walking through this series. We've said we want to forfeit our fear for faith. We want to exchange fear for faith in Christ who does not change. We've said it's not fight or flight. It's not fight or leave, escape. Instead, it's salt and light. We are in the world, we're not of the world, but we're sent into the world. And that's what Jesus taught us in John chapter 17. Well, today we're going to talk about this courageous faith, and it all starts in the home. So today we're going to talk a bit about marriage. Next week, we're going to talk about the family. You're going to be introduced to a new um, comprehensive process that we have here in our church. You'll be so thrilled to see uh, what our family ministry team has been working on for a year as to how we guide children and then launch them from graduation of high school into this world, prepared to follow Jesus every day. Now, I've got to say this before we dive in. Many of you are here, you're not married. Maybe you saw or you looked at the bulletin, maybe it's your first time or just heard me say this is about marriage. Now, some of us who are not married, maybe you're single, maybe you're a widow or widower, maybe you're divorced and you're thinking, well, this sermon's not for me. Not so fast, not so fast. Because today, what I want us to do is see through biblical marriage and specifically a Hebrew marriage, how we see the gospel being played out. I would say it this way, to understand biblical marriage is to understand the entire arc of redemptive history in the Bible. 
So this message is for everyone. Now, we have a wedding that's coming into our family. Some of you know, my daughter Emily was married last December. Her twin sister is getting married within a year, November the 5th. And that's why you, well, I've been out begging for more money. But I, I, um, we are going to get this done, and it's going to happen. And we're excited. She's marrying a wonderful young man, loves the Lord. He's a worship leader. In fact, he lives in Charlotte is the only thing we don't like about him. Charlotte's a great place to come through, North Carolina to come from. But he is uh, he's wonderful. Jeff is his name. And um, Macintosh is their last name. He has a brother, Archibald Macintosh, and his dad is Arch Macintosh, good uh, Scottish uh, blood, I think, running through his veins. But we love Jeff, and he and Whitney are excited about their marriage, and so we're talking a lot about weddings. We're talking a lot about marriage these days, and I uh, actually have shared this message with Whitney. I don't always gather my family together and, and offer the sermon on Saturdays, though they beg for me to do that. Um, <laughs> constantly. I I just say, no, 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 no. Come to church. Just come and hear it, and it'll be enough. But I did. I talked through this. Whitney's on a uh, bachelorette weekend um, with friends at a lake house this weekend, so we preached the sermon to her. She got all excited, so I was kind of excited about that. I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 2 is where we're going to be. To understand the gospel is to really understand marriage, and even better, to understand marriage here today is to understand the gospel. We're going to go all the way back to Genesis 2, and we're going to look at really the foundation of the home and where courageous faith is born in the lives of all of us. And today is a message for everyone here. Um, first, we're going to see here, as you're, as you're finding your place in Genesis 2, God breathes life into Adam. We see that in chapter 2, verse 7. It's the word suke. In the Hebrew, it's spirit is the word, breath or spirit. God breathes life into him. Verse 15 of chapter 2, if you're there, of Genesis, he took him and put him in a place, in a garden. Notice that uh, God has a specific place for Adam in this massive creation. He has a place for you in this massive creation. From the start, we have a purpose, we have a place, and his place was in the garden to steward what God had given him. And now he's given us uh, the, the great joy of stewarding not only creation, but stewarding the gospel that he's given us, having fearless faith in fearful times. And this is what we see right here. He's given him a purpose. And now we're going to be introduced to uh, the first wedding. I want you to look at this. Now, on, on uh, November the 5th, we're going to have a wedding in the chapel. I wish I could invite all of you, um, but we won't. We're going to invite Whitney's friends and, and others who will come together, and we're going to see her walk down the aisle. Now, I'm going to bring her down the aisle. Stephen, you've done this. Uh, you walk her down the aisle. There's no greater joy than to bring your bride, your daughter, to a wonderful man who loves the Lord. Now, there's also some pain involved in that. We're talking through that these days. Uh, there's some sadness in, in something new and change like that. Uh, our daughter has grown up. But here, God the Father does the honors. He brings the woman to the man to give her to the man. When Adam sees her, I want you to see this. In in fact, it's Genesis 2, 18. You can see it there. Then the Lord God said, it is not good, okay, prior to him bringing the woman, not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now, notice here, Adam, is, he's been given life. He's been given a place, purpose. He's got a perfect relationship with God. He's in paradise, and something's not right. This is before sin enters the world, and it's not good. All of creation was good. Now he says, okay, this is not good. And this is where he brings then a woman to have relationship with him. And when Adam sees her, now here's what happens. And he he forms woman out of man. And in verse 23, let's read this. I want you to see what happens here. He explodes, literally explodes into art. He explodes. This is the first piece of art we see in all of history, according to the Bible. The reason it's printed in your page this way is because it's Hebrew poetry. Okay? It's, he's using parallelism. It's assonance. It's a, it's a repetition. It's a chiastic 
structure. For those of you who are English professors or English majors, it's a song. He explodes into poetry and song. Look at what he says. This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she has been taken out of man. Now in Hebrew, the first words that he says can be translated one or two ways. One is, at last, is what it says. Anybody know the Etta James song? Come on, help me out. At last. Okay, that's all we're going to do right there. That's it. Um, at last. He bursting into song. In fact, uh, you could translate it, uh, finally. He's seen all of creation and all of God's creatures, and he says, nope, nope, nope. Then he says, this is what I've been waiting for all my life. At last. That is James sings it this way. My love has come along. My lonely days are gone and life is a song. This is what Adam's, Adam's singing. I found a dream that I could speak of or speak to a dream that I can call my own. I found a thrill to press my cheek to. A thrill that I have never known. And then she ends the song with this. And here we are in heaven. For you are mine at last. This is precisely what Adam is saying and more, I think. He's saying at last, I found another me, but not me. You're like me, but you're not me. In fact, you're not at all like me. This is amazing. What he's saying is she becomes a perfect complement. She is, you could say it this way, she's a like opposite. If you're working a jigsaw puzzle, you can't put two pieces that are exactly together. They will not go. If they're like opposites, they will fit together perfectly. They're like one another, but they're opposite one another. In the same way we see this, she is the perfect suitable helper, the perfect help meet that he needs. That word suitable helper, the word help, helper that's used here is Isir in the Hebrew. The word means literally, listen to this, military reinforcement. Adam the warrior is given military reinforcement from his wife. That is so powerful. We see it throughout, uh, throughout the Old Testament. When the psalmist write, writes of God, he's my help and my shield. He's my stronghold and my helper in times of trouble. He's saying, I am seeking to live this life with courageous faith, and God is my helper, the Spirit of God in us now, the helper, suitable reinforcement. He is our military reinforcement for the battle. Now, it's interesting to note here that God brings to Adam the perfect like opposite, perfect for him, perfect complement. Not another Adam. And one Eve, not multiple Eves, one Eve. And so what I want us to do is look at the Hebrew marriage. Now, I'm going to open your eyes a little bit if you've never studied this before. Come at it from a different angle because it's going to be um, just a, an amazing reality or realization, a revelation that you're going to see. And you're going to understand more fully what Paul says in Ephesians 5, that marriage is a mystery because it points to something else. Marriage points to the gospel. It's why I'm telling you, if you get this today, listen, single, married, wherever you fall, young or old, if you understand biblical Hebrew marriage, you understand the entire story of the Bible. And it starts right here in paradise. So a Hebrew marriage, the first hearers would have understood this. There's a two-step process in the Hebrew marriage. It's still true today. The first is called, well, let's see it. It's in Genesis 2, 24. You can see it there. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. You might remember the old King James is that he would leave and cleave. You remember that? I like that, literally, and it rhymes. You leave and cleave. Most problems in marriage, doesn't matter how old you are, surely early on this happens in marriages. Most problems in marriages is that one doesn't leave. The parents, often the wife, but not always. 
Not always, but often. And that comes by, that comes by way of the parents as well. Let them leave. Now, Stacy and I, we love, have always loved our parents, been close to our parents. But probably, we've talked about this often, a great gift to us is that, frankly, uh, we missed a lot growing up, having moved away from North Carolina, from Houston to here, but we were on our own from the start. And we, we just saw that that was probably a really good thing, and we have... Uh, missed our parents along the way and raising kids and that's a hard thing but in many ways we were forced to leave so we could cleave there's a two-step process the first is kiddushin everybody say kiddushin kiddushin all right kiddushin I want you to learn two words today you're going to impress all your friends tomorrow um, at the water cooler or wherever you find yourself we don't have water coolers anymore. Wherever you find yourself tomorrow at work or with neighbors, friends. Kiddushin, it means betrothal or engagement, but not like we think of engagement. You'll discover here in a moment. It literally means sanctification. Sanctification is a process by which we consecrate ourselves. We, we are set apart for something else. We enter into Kiddushin at the moment we make commitment in a Hebrew marriage. You are th- in, a, in a period of sanctification. Uh, It had to be at least 90 days, but more often it was a year of preparation. You're in a process of sanctification. You're preparing for the marriage to come. This was a greater commitment than what we know as engagement, as we'll see here in a moment. The second step of the two-step marriage in a Hebrew marriage was nisun. It's pronounced nisun. Everybody say nisun. Nisun. The first one is, everybody, kiddushin. The second is Nisun. Okay, Nisun is the consummation. It's one flesh. This is what we'd say is the marriage or the act of marriage, all that that entails. Consecration uh, after, or, or I should say sanctification, and then comes consummation. Now, this would take more courage than you can realize. This is the leave and cleave. This is, you could say, let go and hold fast, as it says in the ESV. It, the, the Hebrew word really is, the, the writer couldn't find a stronger word than stick. Stick together. The two become one flesh. We'll talk about that here in a moment. The approach to marriage will require courage like you've never known. Think about it. To give yourself fully to someone it takes courage to love your spouse at all times. It takes courage to be single. It takes courage to remain single. If you should remain single, it takes courage to be a widower or a widow. It takes great courage to live our lives unto the Lord as we'll get to here in a bit. All of this is a devotion to him first. During Kiddushin, understand this, the groom would leave his father and mother. Now, that was more of a relational distance than it was maybe proximity. Often, the man was living with the dad. He was, he was working the land. He was part of the family business, as it were. But what he would do during Kiddushin, as she is setting herself apart for him, they've committed to one another for life already. Wedding hasn't come. They're already devoted, and he is going now to prepare a place for her. What he does often, most often, it was to attach a room onto the house existing. He'd work for months, even a year or longer, to prepare a place for her, a place separate where they would go and live with the father's, uh, in the father's house. So, women, sorry, moving in with the in-laws, all right? Sometimes, and ultimately it would be his own place, sometimes he would build his own, if he could, often on the father's land or somewhere nearby. We grew up, they grew up together and close by. Courageous marriage means that you prioritize your life around a single relationship. You're consecrating yourself for one person above every other relationship on the planet, and especially at first, your parents, and every other relationship you find yourself in along the way. I have young moms who come to me and say, you know, my children come first in this decision that I'm making or in my life. No, they don't. Your husband comes first. I have men who I see who set themselves apart, not for their wives alone, but instead, even more so, they set themselves apart for work. Becomes their 
passion, their focus. I see men who set themselves apart for a hobby or for some activity or or even for another person. It's not his wife. To enter into Kiddush means you've made a commitment and your spouse now or betrothed will be the most important relationship in your life by a long shot. Hold fast to her above all else. Hold fast to him above all else. The greatest gift that you can give to your children, I say to your parents, all of us, is to love your spouse. There's no greater security that comes into the life of a child like food through the body. It comes to the child as, as, as what happens when, 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 a, when a mother and a father, husband and wife, love each other. You cannot even estimate the powerful source of security that brings into the life of a child where everything else is spinning out of control. Mom and dad are together. They're stuck. They're one. I've said it this way. The gospel is seen in marriage. It's a mystery. And the children get a front row seat to what it looks like for two human beings to love each other as Christ loves us. So when they get old enough to receive Christ, they hear the gospel, it's not much of a leap. I've seen this all my life. It's why in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul says, you do not belong to yourself. You belong to your spouse. Your spouse does not belong to them. He, He or she belongs to now the spouse. You're in complete now abandonment for with another person. You become the personal possession of another person. It's that kind of radical commitment. After someone enters into Kiddushin, they're married in the eyes of others. In fact, we see this. This is where it breaks down. This is not like our engagement. You see this in the Christmas story. Do you remember that? Matthew 1, 19. It's where Joseph, who is a righteous man, it says he's just. And because he is, he doesn't want to shame Mary when he finds out she's pregnant. This is not my child. He says, I'm going to do this privately. I will divorce her privately. This is because in the Hebrew marriage in Kiddushin, you're devoted, you're committed, you're heading to the altar and and consummation of marriage. It's a much greater commitment. And so there's two steps. You leave, and then secondly, you cleave. Look at the latter part of uh, chapter 2, verse 24, 25. And they shall become one flesh. There it is. Nice soon consummation and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed they were one flesh Jesus emphasized this in Matthew 19 6 when he says they are no longer two but one flesh and therefore he says what God has brought together let no one separate listen you can't divide one it's an indivisible number is what Jesus is saying here. This is what Scripture teaches us. See, the two are no longer two. They're not separated anymore. They're one. In fact, they're so close, you could say they're sharing the same space. Think about it. In marriage, you're sharing the same space and up close and personal, right? Yesterday, Stacy and I spent more than an hour trying to unclog a drain in our bathroom. We were in the same space. We were working hard. I was underneath. I don't know why they make it where you can't really grab that thing and try to turn something. And I was down there taking all the pipes apart because I am a professional plumber. You all know that. (laughs) And she's up there trying to, you know, so we're working away. And um, we, we got along throughout the entire process. Um, didn't fix it. So I, later I got some liquid plumber, didn't work. All right, so but I'm going to have to have somebody come fix it. Anyway, I'm saying that because you find yourself in very practical ways in the same space. But when Adam saw Eve, he says, this is another me. And, and the Hebrew is such that he's saying, I now see myself in you. What happens in marriage is you, your wife, your, your husband becomes a mirror, an opposite mirror, and you see yourself in ways you have never seen yourself. I talk to more young couples, and they say, I never knew how selfish I was until I got married. Precisely. 
See, you're, in, you're face-to-face. You're in the same space as someone else. In fact, in a, in a Hebrew marriage, uh, it's really interesting. Over um, at Temple Emmanuel, um, my friend Rabbi Stern would do a service in the, in the temple, and there would be a canopy uh, over the, the husband and the wife, or the groom and the bride, at a point in the marriage ceremony. It, it's in every Jewish ceremony. If you have it outside, you'll see it's called a kuppah. And, and it has, um, well, you see it there. It has, it, it has a, a canopy over. So you have a portion where we might, you know, have a portion of the wedding here on the, on the floor, the lower level. The husband or the father gives away the bride. Then we come up without the pulpit here in place. And the, the, the two come. Now we find ourselves really in the kupa. We don't have a kupa, but we find ourselves here now before God, the two of them before God and presence of the Word of God, the truth of God, alone. You find themselves now, they find themselves here in the Jewish marriage, in a Hebrew marriage, under the kupa is where it's really, it symbolizes now they're their own, they're be, they've become one, this is Nisun, Kiddushin enters into Nisun under the kupa symbolically, and they find themselves there. This is really, this is, it symbolizes also the bridal chamber. This is where the consummation takes place. Not literally, that, that would be awkward. But later, after they have the honeymoon and such, but it's all this symbolizing the marriage vow is so binding in Hebrew law that, that there was no death penalty for any property crimes, but adultery was a capital offense for both parties. That's why we see again in the Gospels, the woman caught in adultery is brought before Jesus. They're about to stone her to death. And the big challenge was, well, where's the man? Well, what about him? Because both would, uh, would face capital punishment if they were not to stay married. Wow. So Paul, clearly he says, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 16 and 17, this one flesh is, is a sexual union. He says, how could you unite with someone who's not a spouse? That doesn't happen. You instead unite with the one. The marriage vow is binding. It's consummated. The, see, a courageous marriage means you are one with your spouse. It means that you pursue depths of intimacy with another person such as has been never, never known in your life. But it's much more. It is. It's a mirror. So Adam found what he was looking for. Now, I want to say this just parenthetically. Um, one of the things that we have to watch out for in marriage and in singleness, and we see it across our lives in many ways. Someone said there are more idols than there are realities. And even marriage can become an idol. The pursuit of marriage can become an idol. Your spouse can become an idol. And what I mean is this, you can pursue your spouse, or how about this, turn to your spouse for all those things that only God can give you, that's a troubled marriage. It's why early on in marriage, or even later in marriage, we want our spouse to be perfect because I'm coming to you to meet my needs and you're not doing it. It's why we find ourselves talking to folks, even in recent days, with those who are challenged in their marriage. He's not meeting my needs. And you get underneath some of that, she's not meeting my needs, and you realize that they're not pursuing Christ first. And their marriage has become an idol. But it happens in singleness as well. Because the single person is pursuing an imaginary spouse. If I were only marriage worthy, if I could only find that person to meet my needs, then I would have something where all the while the Lord is saying, no, 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 turn to me. No one will ever fill your heart and fulfill your needs like I will. In marriage or as a single person. So we must be careful. It was John Newton, the great hymn writer. He's also a great pastor. He said, Lord, save us from the wonderfulness of marriage. See, it's not that we, that we can love our spouse too much. It's that we don't find superior satisfaction in God alone and love him above all else. It's why Jesus said, your love for a spouse, a mother, or a father, or brother, or sister would be like hatred in comparison to the way that you love God. 
He says, love God alone. Adam found what he was looking for. But I want to ask, have you found what you're looking for? At last. I'm not talking about a spouse. What we need more than anything is the relationship with the one who created us. You'll never find fulfillment in another person until you find it first in, in Christ alone. And then and only then. He has come to you. Not because you're worthy, but because he makes you worthy. And he's gone to prepare a place for you. John 17, I mean John 14 says it this way. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would, have to, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? The bridegroom coming to the bride. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself. That where I am, you may also be. Listen, if you're a believer, you are now in Kiddushin. You're in this process of sanctification, having prioritized a single relationship above every other relationship in your life. And you give your heart to him. He's preparing a place for you. It's why, again, in, in Ephesians 5, Paul would say this. You can see it there. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. He says it's a mystery, and here's why. He gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her. In Kiddushin, we're being sanctified by the word, by the spirit of God at work in us as we obey him. And then it says, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. Listen, it's called mikvah. It's a Jewish baptism. It's a ritual of cleansing and, and, and uh, consecration, purification. Our Jewish friends, many of them in our area have a mikvah in their home. You can walk down into it. It's like a spa. It's a purification of the body and soul, as it were. The wife would enter into mikvah, a process of purification, the bride, before marriage. Now Jesus says, washing of water with the word, with his truth, with the gospel, so that he might present the church, the bride, to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. It's why every bride that walks down this aisle in marriage, every bride that comes down the aisle in Ellis Chapel, she's wearing white. She is pure. She has been made clean. She is purified by the finished work of Christ. Marriage is a picture of the gospel and how he has come to us. He calls himself the bridegroom. Our souls are washed by the finished work of Christ on the cross. Look at what it says in Matthew 9. Then the disciples of John came to him saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast? But your disciples do not fast. And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and they will, then they will fast. He calls himself the bridegroom. He does so other places as well. But what is this reference about mourning? When is the bridegroom going to be taken away? At the cross. And at the ascension. And friends, listen. In Kiddushin, there was also the, the, uh, the groom had to pay a bride price for, for his fiance. He would pay a price to the father, to the family, Based on, it's a, it was a, a compensation based on her value that she brought to the home. You know, every business was essentially a family business, it seemed. And so a woman would work just as the sons would work in the home. And he would come and he was expected to make a payment. Nowadays, in the Jewish wedding and in our weddings, the payment is, is um, symbolized by the ring. Go out, buy an expensive ring. It's a payment. I bought this and I'm giving it now to her. And so we find ourselves here in the story of Laban in Genesis chapter 29. You remember? Jacob ends up serving two a seven-year periods of hard labor for a right to marry. We see the bride price in Exodus 22. We see it again in Deuteronomy 22. We see it along the way through the Old Testament. And here's the thing. Listen. 
The price of something is not simply determined by a price tag that somebody put on it. The value of anything is determined by what someone is willing to pay for it. What they actually lay down for it. You know this, do you not? In 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, your body's the temple of the Holy Spirit that's within you. You're not your own. You don't belong to yourself. You were bought with a price. So therefore glorify God with your body, in your person. Live to him in every way. So what do we do during Kiddushin? We obey him. We worship him. We follow him. We give him undivided attention. We give him our lives. And for some of you who are not part of the bride of Christ, the body of Christ today, listen, I say it often, stop dating the church. Make a commitment to Christ first. Join the body of Christ. Be fully devoted to him so that you can glorify God with your life. You've been bought, my friend. And then it says in Philippians 1, 6, the sanctifying work he's doing. Look at this. I am sure of this, Paul says, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. We find ourselves in Kiddushin. What's more intimate than two people coming together in marriage and then consummating the marriage in Nisun? I'll tell you, the very Spirit of God living inside of you. Closer to you than your own skin. Nearer to you than your own breath. His heart, his spirit now, breathed into you as he did with Adam. The spirit comes into our lives and now we find ourselves living for him, longing for Nisun. It's coming. The day is coming. What is this day he's referring to? Well, look at what it says in Revelation 19. We'll close with this. You can't get much further than this. The entire Bible presented in a single sermon on marriage. Look at this. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, like the sound of mighty, mighty peals of thunder, crying out, hallelujah, like thunder, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. Friends, he has forgiven us completely. We've been made righteous by his righteousness, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. Christ, his righteousness, he says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, not ours. But then we bring our gifts to him. We live for him. And the angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. This is ultimate reality. This is where it is all heading. We find ourselves in Kiddushin being sanctified, having committed our lives to Christ. We've been baptized. We are showing the world we've been purified by the work, the finished work of Christ. And we're now totally forgiven and we live in response to him as we worship him because there's coming a day and we live with the end in sight. Nice soon. It's coming. At last. Let's pray together. Friend, with your heads bowed and eyes closed, I want you to think, how has God spoken into your life? My great prayer has been that you would realize how much he loves you. Not simply you'd learn more about marriage, but you would see that God has come for you in the person of Christ, the bridegroom. has come for his bride. Friend, if you're, if you're married, you need to be aware. If Satan wants to attack the bride of Christ, he will attack the marriage. 
He will attack the home. And he's doing it in spades in our day. Are you loving your spouse as Christ loved the church? Are you sharing the same space? Are you radically devoted to your spouse more than any other relationship in the world? Renew your commitment. If you're single, maybe you've been married, maybe not. If you find yourself now at times lonely, Adam was alone. But the Lord provided. And though he provided a person, he gives us now our helper. Jesus said it was to our advantage that he would go. So the helper would come. The Spirit is there. You are not alone, my friend. If you're a widow or widower, you are not alone. God is with you. Live with courageous faith. Lord, we give you our lives. We thank you for the beauty of your church, the bride, as you are making us into the perfect bride for you. We give you ourselves to worship you with our lives. In Christ's name we pray, amen.